Hi, I'm Katie McKnight, and I am the co-author of Short, Short, Big with Alan Satomer. And I'm going to share with you a lesson from Short, Short, Big that I know that you'll find useful. As teachers, we're always challenged with students being able to discern relevant, strong evidence as opposed to weak evidence. Time for me to put my glasses on and share that lesson for you. Okay, this lesson is honing in on citing relevant evidence, and it's estimated to take like 25 to 35 minutes uh, with your students. And of course, that's going to fluctuate because every classroom is different. But those estimated times that we have in short, short, big are not made up numbers. Those are estimated times that Alan and I have landed on as a result of us doing these lessons in classrooms, classrooms just like yours. So everything that's in short, short, big is already a classroom tested lesson. It's been taught in, in a classroom context. And you'll see that there's an objective first, you know, so in this one, it's teach students what it means to cite relevant evidence that is fitting to the point and apropos. So just a little hint too, if you just copy this, and put it in your state standards, you know, control F and put this in, paste it in, it'll parallel with one of your writing standards for your individual state. So you can have that in your individual lesson plan. So you'll see that we always start off with engage. How are you gonna hook the kids in? So here's an example that we have. So I might ask, should all students learn how to type at least 25 words per minute before they enter uh, fifth grade? So I'm posing that question to all the students. And then the claim it, we teach that strategy earlier in short, short, pig. And I know many of you are familiar with it, of putting the question in the answer. So all students should learn how to type at least 25 words per minute before they enter fifth grade. So I take the question that I posed, and then I model for kids how I turn that into a claim statement. And then cite it. According to research, kids like to eat pizza for lunch. See if anyone can identify a problem with evidence. That's right. It's not relevant. So a lot of times what happens in rubrics is it'll say, cite three pieces of evidence, but we don't talk about how it's relevant. And that's really critical because the evidence, we can't just quote dump or evidence dump. And all of us as teachers have seen that a bajillion times. But does it go back to the claim? Is it relevant? So we're talking about typing 25 words per minute, but then the student puts in, you know, the kids like to eat pizza for lunch. And it's like, hello, that has nothing to do with the focus, the claim. So then what we're going to do next is we're going to read and discuss. So we're going to model for kids, do a whole class reading of pages 84 and 85 that's upcoming. And then citing relevant evidence, checking for comprehension along the way. So here's how it works. And citations always have three parts. So they have to be relevant. It has to be strong. It has to be accurate. Just because I say so, or because I think, doesn't count. So what is relevant evidence? Relevant evidence is fitting to the point and on the button. So I'm gonna share that with students. This I think is one of our best features of short, short, big that Alan and I created. So what we're doing here is that on the left-hand side, we have an example a gold standard, as my co-author um, Alan likes to say. So, so this is the gold standard. So relevant citation of evidence. So the blue is always the claim. The school should offer students enough time each day to eat their lunch. And then here's my evidence. Dr. Mike Paulson, a child nutritionist from Yale University, says that too many schools do not provide long enough lunch periods for their kids. So the evidence is always in green, whether it's paraphrased or a direct quote. So blue is the claim, and then green is the evidence. And then on the right-hand side, here's another example. I have the same claim statement that schools should offer students enough time each day to eat their lunch. And then here's my evidence. Dr. Mike Paulson, a child nutritionist from Yale University, says schools should also make sure kids who ride their bikes should wear helmets. Well, that has nothing to do with the claim statement. It has nothing to do with eating lunch and having the time, enough time to eat lunch. So it's completely irrelevant. 
it might have come from the same article. So that's what I call oftentimes uh, is just quote dumping or evidence dumping. So I pull something, but I'm not really looking at the reasoning of why that hooks back. And that's where the critical thinking comes through. So I may have fulfilled a rubric that says, cite three pieces of evidence. I have evidence, but it has nothing to do with my claim, doesn't develop my claim, doesn't prove my claim. And then we go on and provide additional examples. So again, they have the gold standard on the left, and then they have an example of irrelevant evidence. So they can really see the difference. It takes the ambiguity out of it. Kids need concrete models, and especially in, in grades four, five, six, seven, and eight. It's got to be concrete. They've got to be able to see the difference. So that's what we've done in short, short, big. So once we go through that lesson, now we're ready to read and write. So the students are going to read an article behind the scenes at the White House. So all of our readings are short readings because we this is a writing program. We want students to practice their uh, and hone their skills in evidence-based writing. Students can use any reading strategy that they want but encourage them to consider using annotation. I like to use notes to self. And so in some ways, the article is a long list of different kinds of jobs. So it'd be easy to get confused in that article. So when they're annotating, they might have a graphic organizer of the different jobs and the different things that they do or make notes in the margin. So any kind of annotation or graphic organizer is gonna help kids to hone in on the important information in that text. Then the students can review and share. So have them uh, share their answers and be sure to probe their thought process. Ask why, for example, would they give a score of a two or a one? Because what we're asking is for them to give a score of either one or two to the example. Is it a, is it a strong example? Is it a weaker example? And, and so it's not enough to say one or two, but why you're doing it. And this I think is an important part too of what Alan and I created in Short, Short, Big is that what are you looking for? So in the student worksheet, the number one focus for your evaluation has to be relevance. So remember, so if you look up here, remember citations have three parts, relevant, strong, accurate. And this is what we do throughout the program. Right now, we're just focused on this. We're just focused on relevant. So we wanna make sure that they get strong with that then we go to strong and accurate. Those are subsequent lessons after this. So all we're looking for is, is their evidence relevant? That's what we want to see. So then weigh how well they presented it. You know, did they give a little introduction like Katie McKnight says in her article or the article states or one way to look at this? So some kind of transition that folds that helps to connect with the claim. Did they use the model sentence strong, uh, start, starter? So we give lots of model sentence starters. These are the gold standards. So we want kids to develop that kind of automaticity, that hard wiring as far as how they introduce and how they quote and how they introduce relevant evidence. And so we want them to copy and do as they um, watch us and they're observing as we model. And then it always goes into that next stage where they start going into their practice and refinement. So at this point, it's model and observe for the students and then they copy and do. And also a tip that we have is that the concept of relevance, that can be ambiguous for some students. So that's why we wanna make it concrete and we give those examples of the gold standard and irrelevant evidence. Evidence can be true, it can be accurate, it can be convincing but it can still have nothing to do with the claim. And our experience, I'm sure like yours, is that Alan and I see that over and over and over again with students is that they have a hard time understanding that difference, that uh, if they find evidence, they always wanna use it, right? So they have to understand that sometimes you leave evidence on the table. You know, it's evidence, but it's not gonna help my argument. So research might prove kids like to eat pizza, for example, but that's not, that's why we say it's not relevant evidence because the claim has to do with typing. And, and also give as many examples as you can of relevant and irrelevant evidence. This is where 
something that you're reading right now in class or something that they're reading from another uh, subject could also help them as well. And, and it's really important for them to understand how this connects. So here's the article and you can see that it's very short. It's not a long one. This is a writing program. We wanna make sure that kids have confidence about it. And then this is actually the student work uh, sheet that they're going to do. So when they do, uh, when they give the evidence right here, as the article says, they might learn private information. It's it's important that they keep it to themselves. Um, what do we want to say there? Is that it's slightly or somewhat or clearly defines the claim. So the students do this independently to recap. And then pair them up or have them in small groups. And they can compare their answers and discuss. So it's not so much understanding is it one, two, or three and getting them all right. It's understanding why it could be a one why it could be a two, why it could be a three. So we wanna dig into that subtext so kids understand the differences between evidence and that the key critical thinking and having a successful uh, written argument is how you uh, contextualize the evidence with the claim and how you reason that back. And that's the key. So. And then I love this at the end where it says, out of all the jobs mentioned in the article, what do you think would be the most fun? And maybe add why. Oh, I snuck in another argument. <laughs> so in your opinion, which one do you think is the best and why? Claim evidence. It's also an opportunity to reflect on what they've learned and what they've read. And that metacognition, that reflection piece is often conspicuously absent in lessons. And, and it, a lot of that has to do is because we're always so crunched for time, but it's actually the most critical piece of the lesson because when you reflect and you engage in metacognition about what you learned, it really supports the transition from short-term memory to long-term memory. That's where we wanna get that automaticity going in. They understand why and how they do things with such proficiency that they don't have to, um, it doesn't become a obstacle for them. So that is the lesson on honing on citing relevant evidence. We always want your feedback here at Short Short Big because we created Short Short Big for classroom students like yours, for teachers like you. So we always love to hear from you. And again, thank you for all that you do on behalf of students every day.